There, yes, I think that's correct. The Senate also is Republican held and the right. House probably will be too. Um, the the thing that the Trump campaign did successfully, by the way, reaching those podcasts, um, and it wasn't just men that they reached, but they told men, sometimes low propensity male voters, many young men, there is a place for you here. There's a place for you here. And I, I have talked to some left-leaning friends and I've said to them like, okay, what is, what is the word in your circles that is most associated with the word masculinity? And the answer is toxic because that's the buzzword, right? Mm -hmm. For any left of center person, that is what they associate with masculinity. And I wanna give you an interesting stat. It's reputable. It comes from an American Enterprise Institute um, study of politics and sexuality. Trump was able to reach these men by telling them, like, basically, I don't hate you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you're toxic. I, I don't think that you're the problem with everything in this country. And far too much of left leaning messaging says that to them. Not all of it, but far too much. And the stat is your, your view of yourself as whether you are very masculine as a man is uh, a partisan divide for men. When men say they're very, Republican men say they're very masculine in their own self view um, at 53%. For Democrats, that number is 33%. So there's a real, like, very clear mm -hmm. divide. You know what other two groups identify as very masculine at the same rate as Republican men? Latino men and Black men. Hmm. So when you, when you turn your back on the idea of masculinity, as envisioned by these men, if you don't allow for the idea that there are good men who are very masculine, who are doing their part for America, just like everyone else. And I'm, I'm being a little reductive of the message. This is more of like the message you get from like college world, academia, mm -hmm. but that world leaks out into democratic politics very frequently. Um, so if they're hearing toxic masculinity from you, they might look elsewhere to, I don't know, a guy who's campaigning with Dana White, like <laughs> that's a fit. That's a interesting. Fit. That's interesting because we spend we do spend some time speaking about women voters, but that that swing voter, which is a young man, which we don't really look at that way. I don't know why we just decided not to count him. <laughs> but well, maybe maybe we should. <laughs> it's because they don't usually vote. And I will add this as a positive for ah. Trump's win: having young men engaged in society in this way is very good for everyone because you do not. Any society that sort of has real problems um, with upheaval and social upheaval and uh, crime and all sorts of things, they often have a large population of young unmarried men who are not engaged with society in healthy ways. And so bringing those guys into the tent when they are suffering sometimes from very serious economic problems, lack of educational attainment um, on a bunch of fronts, despite the, all the help women messaging you get, they're the ones who are actually doing worse on many, many metrics. Uh, and if you tell them they have no part in the society, that won't go well for us. So I'm glad they're coming in. I'm glad they see themselves represented and that they can be part of the process. So that that brings the stakes to be very high for the Republican Party. And I promise we really will finish here. I know you, you probably have a million things to do. <laughs> so I just can't I, help I talking. One more thing written down that I do want to make a point about. And other than that, I'm good to go. <laughs> well, the only thing I, I wanted to make sure it is to evenly weight this conversation, because yeah. if the stakes are high for Democrats, it's also high for Republicans. And if you have young men that feel connected to the political process, now there's a question about deliverables mm -hmm. under this new Trump administration. Yep. Uh, I have to, by the way, I feel like I have to be really careful. And I, I don't know if it's because of... Uh, collective trauma from the attempted assassinations of former president Trump. I still, I very much worry about the security and health of our, of all of our politicians. Yes. And I feel like, although we've, we've kind of moved into a different post-election world, I still feel a tentativeness of, I hope everyone stays safe. Like I feel very concerned about that. I just feel like I need to just state that for the record in, in a new Trump administration though, there has to be deliverables. What does that look like? Does it look like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. going in and like completely just dismantling the FDA? Is it a kick down the door sort of thing? Is it a way that, uh, 
you know, President elect Trump does work within the system, can he go into the Department of Justice and say, hey, there's way too much politics here? We got to go after the bad guys, the enemies, not each other. Here's how we're going to do it, but keep some of the framework. Like, what does it look like? Because that's a concern for people that are nervous about that's a real concern. And for people that like uh, President elect Trump, there's a real concern of who's left to work with you. And, yeah. and what is that going to look like? And we've seen you like people for a couple months and then fire them. So what is this new, what, what, what's going on here? Yeah. I, okay. There's a lot there. Um, so I think that uh, one of the great things and one of the reasons that I like, um, like a Yunkin or a DeSantis is because I feel that both of those guys are change agents to a certain degree, but extremely and outside thinkers but extremely informed about exactly what their powers are and exactly how to use them. Hmm. That is not Trump's style. Okay. Trump is like, he comes in, he's bull in a China shop. He's like, I'm going to do these things. Now, sometimes he doesn't mean he's going to do those things. And if those promises are not realized, particularly for a young first time voter, that might disillusion them and send them elsewhere. Right. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of this will come down to who is advising him, who ha, who is thinking through this stuff. I think Elon Musk actually is a person who, whose brain maybe could wrap around the management of the federal government for a minute to try to figure that out. Um, he's also unorthodox, so who knows? Um, but so it'll come down to like who's advising him, whether those people know what the right levers are to pull, because the federal government is a very, very stubborn animal, very resistant to change. However, there are things you can do with the structure of agencies, with where power comes from within an agency. Um, there are ways that you can sell the changes you're making to the American people so that it makes them happy. And then they're on board with you, which makes it harder for your uh, adversaries to say, no, you can't change anything. I think there's an argument to be made for Trump and for Republicans that this was a change mandate of some kind and to pitch those changes. Um, but and this and here's the cautionary part and I'll apply it. Uh, it'll help me make my final point too. I think when people are in charge, they forget to look at their own authoritarian impulses, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a thing that worries me about Trump, not to the degree of my, bless their hearts, very emo colleagues sometimes in the media, but it's a thing that worries me. I want people to know the limits of their power and respect them. Um, but so this is one thing I hold myself accountable for is, yeah, I had a preferred candidate. I had a preferred outcome, but I do not prefer for that person to tread all over these ideas and the limits that the Constitution holds them within. Uh, and I will talk about that as we go forward. A lot of the media will tell you anytime Trump does something that's different, that it's evil and bad and terrible and it blows up everything. Right. <laughs> and it's like, can we just calm down for a second and figure out what he's doing? Is it unorthodox and allowed? It is un is it orthodox, unorthodox, allowed and popular? Would it work? These are interesting things to talk about, but often they go immediately to emergency. And, right. and orthodox and illegal is something different or, or <laughs> unorthodox and unconstitutional. Then yeah. we're in something different. But is it just yeah. different? different. And we haven't thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of this is that for the media, for the left, they have a real blind spot for their own desire to deviate from norms, to not respect the Constitution. Um, I think a lot of people reacted to the fact that under the Biden administration, one of the things that didn't feel normal more normal was, in fact, in New York, and I know you've talked about the charges against Trump, but it truly was a novel, completely new charge created for Donald Trump in the city of New York for that conviction. And that wasn't a good look for the DOJ, for the South District, Southern District of New York, for Biden, because that looked like using the justice system in the ways you say Trump will against your political enemies. So when you're in charge, you get a little excited and you do the things that you're telling everyone that your opponent's going to do, they don't believe you anymore. And there are other examples, like the uh, the college loan one annoyed me, where it's like the Constitution says you can't do this, the judges say you can't do this, the the courts say you can't do this, we're gonna do it anyway. So like, or packing the Supreme Court, that one really annoys me. These are things that 
you can't accuse someone else of doing and then do, and then people trust you. And I think that part, that was part of this too, but a cautionary tale for everyone who's in charge. Uh, yes. 